keynote, we like to start with a bang. For those that don't know her, Eileen Uchitel is a senior system engineer at GitHub and a Rails core member. Please, please come on stage. She is passionate about open source and she is going to talk about the past, the present, and the future of Rails at GitHub. Let's give her a warm welcome. Thank you. You set. Thank you all. Okay, can you all hear me? Cool. I cannot see any of you, so <laughs> if you can't hear me, I won't be able to see you tell me that. Um, uh, as mentioned, I'm Eileen. You can find me anywhere uh, online at the handle Eileen Codes. So that's Twitter, GitHub, blog, email. If it's not Eileen Codes, I don't want you to find me. <laughs> uh, I work at GitHub. I'm on uh, it, the App Systems team. We're responsible for Rails and Ruby and how it inter how those interact with the uh, with the GitHub application. If we find something that doesn't belong in the GitHub application, we upstream it to Rails. We find a bug in Rails that affects GitHub, we fix it. We set standards, we consult on projects, and we do a lot of other stuff that's mostly only Ruby and Rails, which is good, because I like doing that. <laughs> so some of you will predictably think, oh, well, you don't work for GitHub anymore, you work for Microsoft. <laughs> This is true, technically, but GitHub is the same GitHub that you've always known and loved. We just have a little extra support from our new partner, Microsoft. Uh, I also got an email address that I ignore because it doesn't make any sense. It's like the first two letters of my first name and the last five letters of my last name. I can't even remember it. I have to look it up because I can't remember how it's written out. Luckily, we still got to keep our GitHub email addresses. I am also on the Rails Core team. For anyone who is not familiar with Rails Core, we are the team that's responsible for defining what the future of Rails is going to be. We figure out what features are going to go in the next release. We release those releases, and we repeat that over and over again until the next version comes out. So each year, I reflect back on what I've learned and what work I've been doing, and what I'd like to share with all of you at conferences each year. So when I started writing the abstract for this talk, I originally thought that I wanted to talk about the intimate details of upgrading Rails at GitHub. I thought I wanted to show you about our exact process, what I worked on, and what, uh, what worked and what didn't. I had spent more than a year and a half working on the Rails 3.2 to 5.2 upgrade, and I certainly could talk to you all about it for many, many hours. As I started to explore the themes around upgrading, I realized there was a deeper story that I wanted to explore. I started looking at the following questions. How did we end up so far behind Rails Master in the first place? What drove us to upgrade when we were so far behind? The story that I wanted to tell you is the story of the past, the present, and the future of Rails at GitHub. We've been using Rails at GitHub since day one, and at times, Rails and GitHub have had our differences. Many years ago, we forked Rails and we kind of almost wrote our own version. We fought against the framework, we deviated from the framework, and we even wondered if Rails was right for us at all. But at the end of the day, Rails is successful because of, GitHub is successful because of Rails, and Rails is successful because of GitHub. The upgrade didn't just make for a good blog post for hacker news to criticize. The Rails upgrade made it possible for us to use and invest in Rails for the long haul. We can change and influence the framework for our needs while also benefiting the broader Ruby community and open source ecosystem. This story is part historical. We'll look back at the beginning and how GitHub ended up maintaining a custom fork of Rails 2. It's also part technical, exploring what compelled us to upgrade our process and why it was so difficult. We'll look at the costs of not upgrading and how technical debt accumulates until your application and framework start to work against each other. Lastly, this start story is part forward-looking. We'll dive into our effort to, uh, at uh, GitHub to clean up technical debt, our commitment to open source, 
and our responsibility to support rails for the long haul. Let's go back in time to the beginning. In 2004, DHH announced a new Ruby framework called Ruby on Rails. Immediately, Rails caught the attention of the Ruby community. At RubyConf that year, DHH talked about Rails' history, how it came to be, and of course, why it was better than existing Ruby frameworks. He went on to talk about his philosophy in building the framework, most notably that most frameworks fail because they are built without an application in mind. He said that frameworks are retrospectives. They should be ex extracted, not built. Rails was attractive and successful because it was extracted from a real application, Basecamp. In the early years, Rails complexity grew slowly, and Rails 1.0 was released in December of 2005. Two years later, in December of two, uh, in 2007, uh, Rails 1.2 was released. That same year, Tom Preston Warner was at a Ruby meetup in San Francisco when he showed his friend Chris Rain Wainsrath a tool called Grit. Grit was a Ruby tool that allowed you to view Git repositories in an object-oriented way. It would become the basis for Git repos at GitHub. After seeing Grit, Chris was immediately hooked, and a few days later, GitHub was born. GitHub was created using Rails 1.2.3. At this time, we didn't even have a gem file yet, and the only frameworks we had were Action Mailer, Action Pack, Active Record, and Rail Ties. After a short beta, GitHub was launched to the public in 2008. The next day, Rails moved from, uh, in April of 2008, the next day, Rails moved from their own SVN server to GitHub. In 2009, Rails 2.3 was released. In the early days when Rails would release a new version, GitHub would quickly upgrade to get new features and bug fixes. But sometime between 2008 and 2009, GitHub had forked Rails. I couldn't find an exact date because we vendor our gems and always have, so I couldn't find any commits that made it clear exactly when we forked. I had always thought the reason that GitHub forked Rails was because Rails 3 was very slow. Slow enough that many other applications were unable to upgrade. But it turns out that we had forked Rails long before we even knew 3.0 was going to be a problem. Now remember, this was the wild west of Rails startups. No one really knew what the future of Rails or GitHub was going to be. We weren't yet talking about the importance of upgrades or staying current with master. And Rails really wasn't as stable as it is today. I don't want to go as far as to say that Rails didn't care about performance or stability at this time, but I know a lot of app developers felt that way. It definitely wasn't a concern the way it is now. Maybe that was because we were all kind of inexperienced back then, or maybe it was because Rails was good enough for its most important user, Basecamp. Or maybe it was because we, GitHub, didn't contribute enough upstream. I'm not criticizing the past, but it's important to look at what happened then so we can improve for the future and, and learn from our mistakes. The problem was that GitHub didn't just fork Rails and add a bug fix here or a performance improvement there. It wasn't just a fork with backports from upstream. GitHub's fork was Rails with custom code just for GitHub. It was Rails morphed into a different framework that, that, that was built for GitHub the way Rails was built for Basecamp. And as GitHub doubled down on our fork and added more and more functionality, Rails continued to progress at a fast pace. At the time, no one could predict or understand the cost that forking Rails would have on GitHub's application or engineering team. In 2010, Rails 3.0 was released, but as I said before, many applications couldn't upgrade due to performance concerns. The performance issues in 3.0 were a big deal. Users saw an unacceptable increase in response times, some applications saying that requests were taking twice as long, and active record in Rails 3 was five times slower than Rails 2. Despite knowing about the performance concerns, a few engineers at GitHub started working on an upgrade from to Rails 3 and Ruby 1.9. You see, GitHub hadn't just forked Rails, we had forked Ruby 2, which made upgrades even more difficult. The Rails, and the Rails 3 upgrade wasn't Rails 3 upstream. It was still Rails 3 fork with all a bunch of weird stuff added on top. And from experience, I can tell you that trying to upgrade while backporting all of those changes that you made while trying to go to a new version is enough to make someone want to quit programming. And I don't recommend it. 
In 2012, Rails 3.2 was released, and most of the performance concerns had been fixed by Aaron Patterson and other contributors. In the same year after the performance issues were fixed, GitHub's progress on the Rails upgrade stalled. It had been two years since they started the 3.0 upgrade, upgrade, and the engineering team began questioning whether the effort was worth it at all. They asked each other, why upgrade when this version isn't causing us pain? Why upgrade when Rails 3.0 isn't so great? Why upgrade when our fork has more features and it's kind of just better? Looking at these questions, the engineering team decided the upgrade wasn't worth their time, and they focused their attention on other projects. The truth is, at this time, GitHub wasn't yet feeling the pain of being on a fork of Rails. And it's really difficult to convince a team to upgrade when they're still feeling productive. You make your tests faster when they feel too slow. You refactor the complexity of that class when you have to add new functionality. But when do you upgrade? What's the incentive to upgrade to 3.0 if it's just not good enough and your fork is working just fine? What's the incentive if you don't feel the pain of being on a fork? Eventually, however, all of these why should we upgrade questions <laughs> would become suffocating for the engineering team. It became harder and harder to find where the framework ended and the application began as GitHub engineers started to fight against the, the fork and, the app and their application. Security backports were a nightmare. Each time Rails announced a new vulnerability, GitHub was forced to manually patch it. Hiring was becoming increasingly difficult. No one wants to work on a Rails 2.3 application that doesn't even resemble Rails 2. It's harder to get up to speed, and you can't Google search how to do anything. Dependencies were brittle and unsupported as gem authors focused on new versions of Rails and abandoned the old ones. Development was slow and painful. Working with an application that's tied so heavily to a custom fork can make adding features or doing refactorings increasingly difficult. We realized we needed to upgrade and get off a fork or that fork was going to suffocate the application. So in 2014, a team of four full-time engineers and a few volunteers banded together, wrote an upgrade plan, and got to work. It took the team six months of full-time coordinated effort to deploy Rails 3.0 to production, and a few months later, Rails 3.2 was deployed as well. It's important to remember that 3.0 and 3.2 here are still a fork of Rails with custom GitHub patches added. By this time, the Rails 3 series was only receiving severe security patches. So even though the upgrade was a success, the code base and the fork was still very far behind master. The effort put into upgrading from 2.3 to 3.2 was massive. And for whatever reason, the motivation dwindled after that. It would be another two years before the 4.0 upgrade was started. That same year, Rails 5 came out. I'm sure to some, it felt like GitHub was just never going to catch up if Rails was constantly improving and releasing new versions. I know it many times I felt that way when I was doing the upgrade. And I was on the Rails core team. I knew when they were coming. Still is stressful. In 2017, I joined GitHub. At this point, the Rails 4 upgrade was not in a good place. There was no dedicated team working on it, and the upgrade had fallen by the wayside. I asked Hubot to run the tests for me in, for, in Rails 4 just to see how bad it was. There were 4, 000, more than 4,000 errors. Luckily, Hubot can't count, so uh, they actually double the errors. But so 2,000, that's easy, right? Nothing, no problem, takes 2,000 errors. At least by this point, GitHub engineers had added some tooling that made Rails upgrades easier. They'd set up a system that allowed us to dual boot the application in multiple Rails versions. This meant that we didn't need to maintain long-running branches. If your application is like GitHub and hundreds of branches are being shipped a day, keeping up to date with all the merge conflicts will make your upgrade a lot harder. By adding the ability to dual boot the application, we could focus only on test failures instead of merge conflicts. Unfortunately, this method requires hacking Bundler, since Bundler doesn't support multiple gem files yet but I'd rather monkey patch bundler than fork rails. <laughs> this allowed us to boot the server, the console, and run the tests in Rails 3.2 and 4.0, which made it easier to compare and contrast behavior between each version. Uh, this, and the process allowed us to incrementally upgrade Rails and prevent regressions once we had a build that was green. So when the 4.0 build was green, 
we'd make it required for everyone at GitHub to write code that passed in 3.2 and 4.0. Once the 4.1 build was finished, we would make everyone write code in 3.2 and 4.1 until we deployed the until we deployed 4.2 to production and then 4.2 and 5.0, and that's how we did it. In the application, we used helper methods to easily condition the code for different Rails versions. We always w put the production version in the if clause, and then the, all of the future code goes in the else clauses, so that way when we upgrade to 4.2, the same code that we already fixed for 4.1 won't fall back to the 3.2 code. In March of 2018, a year and three months after I started at GitHub, we deployed Rails 4.2 to production with zero downtime and limited customer impact. While a huge success, the Rails 3.2 to 4.2 upgrade took a really long time. So after deploying 4.2, I wanted to get started on 5.0 immediately because I didn't want to lose momentum, but honestly, I was very burned out. I had been the only engineer working full time on the Rails upgrade. We had other volunteers that were awesome and they helped out, but that wasn't their full-time job. They had other projects to attend to. Upgrading Rails is a difficult and lonely task, and I just told my manager I would refuse to do the 5 Series alone. So for the 5 Series, I led a team of four full-time engineers. Uh, we still had some volunteers occasionally, but these four engineers worked full-time on the Rails upgrade and nothing else. Um, by this time, I had learned what processes worked and what didn't. So once uh, once we had the builds ready, I took every single fail unique failure and put it into a GitHub project so that we could track each individual failure and find out how we could track progress and see how, um, how much better the build was doing. Because we had a dedicated team and a streamlined process, the upgrade from 4.2 to 5.2 took only five months. And in August of 2018, we deployed Rails 5.2 to production. Uh, this deploy also went out very smoothly with zero downtime, and I think we only had a few customers impacted. It was barely any exceptions. It was kind of amazing. Uh, we learned a lot. We we learned a lot from deploying the 4.2 uh, to production, and so 4.2 deploy took two or three months because we were so nervous about it. Whereas 5.2, after a few test deploys, we were out in a couple weeks. Um, it turns out our test suite is actually pretty solid, which is good. <laughs> Upgrading to 5.2 was a huge milestone. It was the first time in 10 years, 10 years that GitHub wasn't on a fork of Rails. It was the first time in 10 years that GitHub was on the most recent version of Rails. That's 10 years of cumulative technical debt, 10 years of fighting the framework from within our application. But we had finally started to pay the debt off. Of course, by upgrading, we didn't eliminate technical debt, but we created breathing room in the application that we hadn't had in a decade. So I hope that learning about our upgrade hasn't scared you into not doing your own upgrade. The point of this talk is not to tell horror stories. It's to show you that there's a cost to not upgrading, and that cost is cumulative. After hearing about our Rails upgrade at GitHub, I've had engineers at other companies come to me and ask me how to convince their leadership team to prioritize and upgrade along with features. They don't have the resources or it's not on their roadmap. It's not a priority for the company or their leadership thinks it will be too expensive. It's true that upgrading is expensive and time consuming and I'm not going to tell you otherwise. But it's easier to say this upgrade will need X number of engineers at Y number of dollars an hour for Z number of hours. You can measure that cost and decide whether it's too expensive or not. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how expensive an upgrade is going to be because the cost of not upgrading is immeasurable. Not upgrading your application will eventually cost more than any upgrade because tech debt that accumulates when you don't upgrade makes it harder to get out from under that. When you don't upgrade Rails, you have to become a security expert. The Rails core team only supports patching security issues in the current major version and major versions of the previous version. So that means that as of today, we only support master 5.0, 5.1, and 5.2. If you're on 4.2 or lower, your team ends up being responsible for understanding and patching security vulnerabilities yourself. It's very hard to get this right because on the Rails core team, we don't reveal how to outright exploit the vulnerability to protect those who can't upgrade immediately. 
Not upgrading Rails requires you and your team to be responsible for manually patching vulnerabilities, and this can be really hard to do right. When you don't upgrade Rails, you lose out on great talent. Boot camp grads, college grads, career changers, and all kinds of engineers aren't learning Rails 2.3, and they definitely aren't learning your weird custom fork. <laughs> Those engineers not only don't want to work on an old version, but they don't have the knowledge or the skill of how that version of Rails even works. I probably wouldn't have taken the job at GitHub if we had still been on a fork of 2.3. I don't want to work on an application on a version of Rails that doesn't let me contribute to open source. I don't want to work on a version of Rails that's 10 years old. And I don't want to work on a version of Rails that I can't Google. <laughs> we all do it. <laughs> Being on a version of Rails that's th this old will hurt your hiring pipeline. When you don't upgrade, some of the gems that you rely on will become abandoned or deprecated, so you'll either have to live with bugs or fork yet another dependency. New gems may not support old versions of Rails, and you won't be able to use those, or, or you'll have to fork them, and it's terrible. This makes development harder. Every choice and dependency becomes more difficult because you're so far behind. Maintaining old gems on top of your old framework will get tedious and annoying very quickly. When you don't upgrade Rails, you end up building more and more infrastructure on top of your fragile application, and it makes development more painful. I've seen this firsthand at GitHub. We have tons of infrastructure code in our application, multiple databases, CI tooling, our own job queue, and definitely things that I have yet to find. Ideally, your application would consist only of code that makes up your product. GitHub's value is not in that we have code that makes multiple databases work in Rails. Our value is in our community, our repos, our issues. Multiple databases allows us to keep our application up and running, but it's not what our application is built for. This infrastructure code makes development more painful because of how tightly it couples your application to Rails internals. Minor changes can easily turn into massive refactorings. But the biggest cost of not upgrading Rails is that someday someone on your team will decide that using Rails was a mistake and that it's time to carve your application up into microservices. <laughs> now, this is not a language war talk, and I'm not criticizing Go or how other people build their applications, but we're at a Ruby conference. So I'm going to at least assume you like writing Ruby. I love writing Ruby, and I want to keep getting paid to write Ruby. This might seem like an exaggeration, but if we don't upgrade Rails, we won't get to keep writing Rails. The Rails ecosystem won't improve, our applications will degrade, and we'll be faced with an expensive rewrite. Upgrades might cost a lot, but rewrites come with a hefty price tag. They may even cost you your job. The key to upgrading Rails is to incrementally pay off the cumulative technical debt that you've incurred and figure out a plan to keep that debt paid down. I won't stand here and tell you that upgrading Rails will be easy. I'll leave that to the person on Hacker News who wondered why I couldn't do it faster, because they could do their upgrade in a weekend. The upgrade did take a long time, but it wasn't the only thing that we worked on. We deleted unused features, we rewrote our custom test framework, we improved the database handling for development and test environments. It's unfair for anyone to look at our upgrade timeline and decide that using Rails is just too expensive because it's too hard to upgrade. We made choices at GitHub over the years that made upgrading harder. You have also likely made choices in your applications that will make upgrading harder. But that doesn't mean that Rails is a bad choice or we're bad engineers. Technical debt is real, and you and your team have to make decisions about what debt is acceptable to you and what debt needs to be cleaned up. At GitHub, we have just finally decided that being behind Rails Master is no longer a technical debt that we're willing to put up with. So you can slowly work on technical debt and upgrade Rails to get your application into a better place. To show you how you can do it, we're now going to look at things that you should consider when upgrading and mistakes to avoid so that you don't end up doing a seven-year upgrade like we did at GitHub. The first most important step is to build a team. Upgrades are difficult, and it helps to have a team that can support each other, bounce ideas off of, and make sure that momentum keeps up. If you have a one-person upgrade team and that person leaves your company, your upgrade's gonna 
be severely stalled or maybe stopped altogether. Make sure to create redundancy and support for such a difficult and important project. If you have a really small team and need to upgrade, consider hiring a contracting firm to help you get out of the weeds. It will be expensive, but it's cheaper than not upgrading, and they can also help you institute some best practices so that you don't end up so far behind in the future. Another thing that makes upgrades easier is taking the time to plan your upgrade. Your team should ask themselves, do we want to upgrade incrementally from 3.2 to 4.0 to 4.1, etc., or do we want to go straight from 3.2 to 5.2? You may want to in upgrade incrementally so that you can see each of the deprecation warnings, or you may just want to rip the Band-Aid off. Our upgrade was long enough that it made sense to work incrementally so that we could have a sense of accomplishment and stay motivated. This might not make sense for your team. You should also consider whether you want to do a long-running branch or get your application booting in multiple Rails versions. It may not be feasible for you to dual boot your application and, and add extra CI builds. These are things to consider before starting the upgrade because upfront investment may save you time and money later on. You can also make your upgrades easier by fixing deprecation warnings early. Instead of ignoring them to, to care for the next version, fixing them as soon as you see them is a good way to make your upgrades a little bit easier. Some deprecations that are related to major changes can block you from actually upgrading. So for an example is in the alias method chain that was deprecated in 5.0, when it was removed in 5.1, if you didn't fix that, your app won't boot. So then you can't see any failures after that, and then you can only have one person working on fixing that one issue until you get to the point where you fixed it. So doing that stuff early can help make upgrading later smoother. When you're working on an upgrade, it's helpful to add a linter to prevent regressions. If you want to make sure your team isn't adding new headaches to your code base, adding a linter or a test that fails when a certain Rails code path is used reduces the chance of you having to keep redoing the same fix over and over again. Once you've upgraded to the most recent version, make a plan for future upgrades. How often will your team upgrade Rails in the future? Are you willing to test new versions of Rails in a beta or a release candidate phase? This helps make upgrades smoother because you can tell us on the Rails core team if we did something wrong, we broke something, or something's hard. If you can't run Rails master in production, you can invest in dual booting CI so that you can test 5.2 and six, Rails 6 simultaneously. If you invested in upgrading, it makes sense to invest in future tooling that will help you keep your upgrade, keep out of upgrade debt in the future. The upfront investment will pay dividends later on. So now that we've looked at things that you should consider when you're upgrading, we'll now look at things that you should not do because you will regret them. Something that you're likely to regret in the future is forking Rails. The choice to fork Rails and deviate from upstream was the single most expensive choice GitHub made in regards to our application. This had a compounding effect on the state of the code base that made our upgrade from two to five take seven years. It was because of this choice. If you absolutely must fork Rails, you should try to at least track upstream as closely as possible and only use it to backport uh, fixes, bug fixes or features that you need. If you add features that you never intend to upstream to Rails, your fork will deviate from upstream and make upgrading way more difficult in the future. You also may upgrade falling behind on Rails upgrades until the point that, your Rails team, that the Rails team no longer supports your version. If you need to stay on an unsupported version of Rails, you should use Rails long-term support, who's a sponsor. Uh, they will maintain the fork for you and then ensure that the security patch is accurate. If you fall behind on Rails upgrades and end up writing your own patches, you may do it wrong and leave an insecure endpoint. In general, the best way to do security patches is to rely on Rails upstream. Ensuring your application tracks the most recent version of Rails can reduce any surprises when you need to apply a security upgrade. If you're also using old, unsupported gems, then your upgrade is going to be more difficult because you'll be required to replace those dependencies before you can finish your upgrade. We had to do this with Sinatra. We went from 4.2 to 5.0 because Rails went from requiring Sinatra 1 to Sinatra 2 because Rack went from requiring something to something. It was terrible. Ensure that you upgrade your de dependencies often to keep in line with Rails requirements. This will pre prevent you from ending up using a gem that gets abandoned by its maintainer. You also may regret using Rails private APIs. In Rails, private APIs are code that's purposefully undocumented or under the private namespace. 
We, we reserve the right to change these APIs without deprecation or warning. Uh, we probably don't even make a change log sometimes. So if your application is relying on this behavior, it could just disappear tomorrow. It's best to always use the public documented methods in Rails because we will tell you when we're going to deprecate or change those. And lastly, you should avoid writing monkey patches. Of course, monkey patching can sometimes be un unavoidable, so if you must use one, make sure that you conditionally wrap it in the Rails version that it's required for and heavily document usage. You don't want an old monkey patch interfering with Rails and breaking your application in an unexpected way. At GitHub, we had like all of these monkey patches that were for Rails 3.0 that were no longer valid in newer versions, but we had no idea what they were used for because they weren't documented, so it made it a lot harder to get rid of them. All of these things that we looked at can compound the cost of your upgrade. It's easy to see how these decisions cause us to accumulate debt in our applications. I'm hoping that you're now feeling a bit more confident that you too can do an upgrade. I know it's going to be hard. You might cry. You'll definitely get angry. You may even curse past engineers that no longer work at your company. I definitely did. But I want you to know that you can do it. I have faith in you. You may be thinking, OK, well, Eileen, it wasn't easy, but you're on the Rails core team, and you work at GitHub, and I'm not capable of doing an upgrade. It's too hard, and I can't do it. So I'm going to tell you something that shocked a lot of people, not because I want to pat myself on the back, because I want you to know that you can do this. Before the Rails 3.2 to 5.2 upgrade, I have never done a major multi-version Rails upgrade before and deployed it to production. I have only ever done Basecamp 3 small incremental on Rails master. So if I can do it, you can do it. I'm not smarter than you, and I'm not better than you. Upgrading Rails isn't going to be easy, especially if you've taken on a lot of these cumulative costs that we've looked at. While you're working on your, on your upgrade, it's important to remember a few things. You don't have to solve all of your technical debt problems tomorrow. You can pay your debt down incrementally. Start with that class that uses a private Rails API. Remove or document your monkey patches. Identify and upgrade Rails dependencies that are out of date. Rails upgrades are not a sprint. They're a marathon. If you and your team need, uh, in incrementally pay down the debt that you've incurred, it will be possible to eventually upgrade. If you, I, uh, I also want you to remember that you're not alone. Many before you have done an upgrade and many after you will do an upgrade. Find others that are doing a Rails upgrade at the same time or folks who have done it in the past that you can lean on for support. I knew that Shopify had done their own hard upgrade and there was a light at the end of the tunnel because they did it, so I could do it. I felt comfortable asking the engineers that I knew at Shopify for help and support and how they did it so that I didn't feel alone. And lastly, remember that the payoff is worth it. Upgrades take a long time and they're difficult, but being afraid of upgrading isn't going to make it go away. When you upgrade your, applica when you upgrade, your application will be in a better place. Other than, not in other than not incurring the cost that we looked at earlier, there are a ton of benefits to upgrading. In addition to better security, easier, easier hiring, and more manageable dependencies, doing the hard work of upgrading will give you improved APIs. Major version upgrades allow us to rethink how previous features were designed in Rails and whether we can improve those in the next version. An example of an improved API in Rails 6 is the handling for multiple databases. Before Rails 6, adding multiple databases to Rails was awful and very hard and required a lot of hacking Rails internals. You had to write a ton of code yourself, but in Rails 6, we added new APIs for establishing and handling connections, as well as an improved API around database configurations. Without upgrading, you don't have access to these features. Upgrading to a new version of Rails also improves security. In addition to security upgrades being easier, if you're not behind, each version adds new security features to protect your application and users from bad actors. In Rails 5, we introduced perform CSRF tokens. Rails 5.2 introduced encrypted secrets. And Rails 6 will ship with improved security around potentially dangerous ARL methods. These features help keep your application safe and secure. Since these, are since these are security features and not vulnerability patches, the only way to get these is to upgrade your application. Although Rails 3.0 was plagued by performance issues, newer versions of Rails takes performance very seriously. 
The Rails team is always looking for areas to make Rails faster in all environments. And Rails 6 is actually going to ship with a fix for a long time existing memory leak in view loading for development and much faster active support notifications. Upgrading Rails also gets you access to new libraries. Rails 6 is shipping with brand new libraries like Action Text and Action Mailer, Active Mailer, one of them, Mailbox. <laughs> Active Mailbox, I think. I don't know, I didn't write them. <laughs> They're there. There's two new frameworks. By upgrading, you can rely on great new features in Rails without building your own infrastructure tooling into your application. In an ideal world, your application would only contain code that pertains to your product. If your product is not about sending mail, then you shouldn't have to write code that sends mail in your application. Rails should do that for you. Upgrading Rails helps you keep the line where Rails ends and your application begins crystal clear. And lastly, upgrading your application gives you a chance to contribute upstream. It's really difficult to fix bugs, add features, and influence the future of Rails from an old version. It's not a requirement to contribute if you're on a new version, but it definitely opens doors that were otherwise closed. As DHH said in 2004, and many times since, frameworks are extracted. We build Rails from our existing needs, but if those needs are set back in Rails 2, 3 times, it's hard to make a case for an extraction our application requires. All of these are good reasons to upgrade, but this is the one that kept me going. This is the reason that I spent more than a year and a half of my life upgrading Rails at GitHub. It was so that GitHub could influence the future of Rails. For us, this is the biggest and most important reason to upgrade. By upstreaming features, fixing bugs, and supporting Rails' future, we're supporting our application. When I look back at when I started the Rails 3.2 to 5.2 upgrade, the thought of being on a modern version of Rails and actively contributing upstream felt like an unachievable fairy tale. We were so far behind that I often wasn't sure if I could finish it, at least not without, at least not while also maintaining my sanity. But now we're regularly contributing to Rails and we're supporting the future of Rails and this is part of GitHub's present and future state. Since upgrading Rails, GitHub engineers have sent over 60 pull requests that improve performance, fix bugs, and add major functionality to Rails 6 alone. Before we upgraded, we were often forced to add a monkey patch or work around bugs in overly complex ways. Using Rails 5.2 has allowed us not just to contribute upstream, but to make choices that improve our application instead of hinder it. And all of you here benefit from those changes as well. Our goal is to never fall behind again. We're investing in our applications by doing continuous upgrades. Every week we bump our Rails gem and run all of the Rails tests against that new version. This lets us find regressions quickly in Rails and fix them before we release that version. It also lets us test all of GitHub's code in both Rails 5.2 and Rails 6 simultaneously. Since we did the hard work of upgrading major versions, this new process means that we will never fall behind and upgrades are easy because we are doing them as Rails changes instead of many years later. We're confident because of this work that Rails 6 is performant, stable, and has great features for all of you. We're aiming for the GitHub application to be on Rails 6 the day it's released. In addition to bug fixes and performance improvements, we've extracted major functionality from GitHub. I won't go into technical details, but we extracted our, multiple, our handling from multiple databases in Rails 6. We used our knowledge and our expertise on database handling to create an easy to use, robust new API for defining, establishing, and switching between databases in your application. We did this extraction not just because it benefits Rails, but because it allows us to reduce complexity in our application. This is evidence that for the first time in GitHub's history, we're not just using Rails or simply building a Rails application. For the first time in GitHub's history, we're pioneering the future of Rails. We're extracting code from GitHub, building new features into Rails that will help you scale your application, and giving back to Rails in order to support it for the long haul. It makes good sense for us to do this. Not only do we give back to our community, but it helps our application stay focused on our product. We can reduce complexity and improve resilience all while changing the future of Rails. 
at GitHub, we not only need to do this for our own application, but we have a responsibility to support Rails. We owe part of our success to the Rails framework, and we have the influence, expertise, and application to help push Rails forward. Upgrading Rails was a huge investment. It wasn't cheap, but it was worth it. Upgrading Rails opens up a ton of possibilities to our future, and we have a bright path ahead of us. We can build features faster, we can be more confident our code base is stable, we can improve the scalability of Rails, and we can give back to the open source community. We owe our success to open source. At a minimum, we went from being crushed by Rails and the decisions that we had made in our application, to building up our application, to building up Rails, to building up our community. Upgrading Rails gave us the freedom and flexibility that we didn't have before, and it empowers our engineers to build more. This investment in upgrading Rails um, started in 2007 when Upgrade was born. When Rails was born, Upgrade was born. Okay, when Rails was born, and 11 years later, we're finally tracking master. It took seven years from the day the Rails 3.0 upgrade was started to the day the 5.2 upgrade was complete. The future is bright, and I can't wait to see what the next 10 years allows us to extract from GitHub, build in Rails, and how the community thrives. As long as GitHub is using Rails, we'll continue to invest in the future of Rails and our community because we have to, because we want to, and because we need to. We'll continue to, to invest in the future because GitHub and Rails are in it together for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you, Eileen. Thank you for being such an inspiring oh, engineer. Good. And Thank here's you. a small gift from oh, us. It's so cute. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs>